Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who I don't know or who have not met me, my name is Jerry Reed. I work with MSU Global. Uh, for the next few minutes, uh, Dave Shepard, my colleague from AIS, and, and I will be talking about the non-credit registration system. Uh, by the show of hands, how many people have, are familiar with the non-credit registration system or have been to one of the show and tells or various meetings? Okay, so about half of you. How many people, this is the first time you've ever heard of it? Okay. All right, so that means I probably won't get fired. That's good news. Our job at MSU Global is to try to evangelize the system and let people know about it. So three people out or four people out of this group, that's not too bad. So we'll, we'll, we'll take that as a, as a chalk up a, a win there. Um, essentially, um, the non-credit registration system, uh, what we're going to do today in giving you a little bit of an overview, uh, we're not going to demo the system. We're not going to go through anything. But I want to give you a little bit of a history about uh, where it all got started, kind of some of the current uh, developments and where we're at. And then Dave's going to talk to you um, in more detail about some of the technology, if you will, and how it relates to you as, as web developers and so on. So hopefully we can uh, kind of customize this a little bit for your needs and, and give you some information that will be pertinent and relevant to, uh, to what you might be thinking about as you go back to your various units and so on and so forth. So with that, Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the non-credit registration system, essentially it's a centrally supported, uh, university supported web-based registration system is really what it is. It supports uh, non-credit products and services, things like courses, programs, seminars, workshops, events, and, and related goods and services. So that's really what it's built to do. When the system was first being thought about, and we'll, we'll go through the history here in a moment, but really the, the key points of, of why NCRS exists is one, to try to provide some uh, centralized efficiency. Uh, as you can imagine, units are handling their non-credit activities in a multitude of different ways. Uh, some are doing it in a more sophisticated manner than others. Uh, some are using more complicated database structures. Some are writing things on the back of a napkin. So essentially what this is set up to do is try to provide a centralized, efficient way for people to keep um, information or records about students who are pursuing non-credit activity at the university, as well as provide a way for you to be able to uh, sell those things through, through an e-commerce um, e mechanism. One of the benefits of the non-credit registration system and one of the things that was really an initial key point in, in setting this up is for those people that have online offerings that might have something in, in the angel learning management system, there are a lot of units that are providing manual operations to get students and registrants connected to angel. So one of the things that the non-credit registration system does is provides that automatic connection to angel when somebody purchases uh, one of the events that happens to be in, in angel. And the other piece is there's an interest both at the unit level and also at the higher level administration uh, areas to begin to get better information and data about what's happening in the non-credit arena. As you can imagine, as units are doing things kind of in a one-off situation or on their own, it's really hard to get aggregated data and information uh, about what's happening. So hopefully, as the non-credit registration system uh, grows, that opportunity will also grow. So who's involved? Uh, there's a multitude of organization and units, uh, and they're not all represented here, but some of the key players are represented. Obviously, um, AIS, Administrative Information Services, plays a key role as they are really the developers and the, the maintainers uh, of the system and have, have built the, the system really from the ground up. Uh, MSU Global already mentioned our involvement. We are responsible for telling you about the system and getting out and talking about it. We also serve as uh, what we would call the client services aspect as well. So if your unit will, were to become engaged with the system, you would work with, with us, you would work with AIS on certain technical issues and so on and so forth. But our job is really to make sure that the operation for you using NCRS runs smoothly. The registrar is involved when it comes to things uh, in the data management area. So a student needs a record. A uh, student calls five years from now and says, hey, I thought I took something from communication arts and science, sciences in this particular area. Can I get information about that? And so the registrar's office would function much like they do on the credit side when you think about a transcript. So being able to provide that official record, if you will. Um, LCTTP, uh, those folks are involved in, in de uh, designing and working with us on the training materials and also the delivery of the training uh, for the system. 
And then ATS also provides support. Virtual University Design and Technology, VU DAT, is involved uh, in the development of the programming, but also in the way in which it connects to ANGEL. And of course, uh, MSU Libraries, the Distance Learning Services, are the folks that provide the really the customer support and client support because of their 24-7 ability. So if you have customers that are utilizing the system, if they have issues or problems, their first line of defense will be DLS. If you're a client of the system internal at MSU, you would also start with DLS as, as a troubleshooting mechanism. So those are just some of the people that are involved in the project. The timeline, um, as you can imagine, any MSU project, this is pretty typical. This started really back in early 2005. Brendan Gunther from Virtual University, uh, myself, um, others from AIS, and so on. We're talking about, really at the time, the need to make a connection, really an automatic connection to ANGEL, and also as we were first starting to understand the compliance issues that we knew were coming in relationship to e-commerce, uh, really trying to find a centralized way or at least an easier way to make those things happen and, and make that work go more smoothly. In November 2005, that uh, some folks got together from MSU Global Virtual University, University Relations, and, and we held what at that time was called the Ecom Action Team. So we got together and actually, um, I was going to send this to Brendan the other day, I found the actual plan that was put together as a result of that meeting, at which point we anticipated it would take us about three months to accomplish the project. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see uh, this turned very fast into a typical MSU project, uh, and we're now five, six years into uh, the project. Um, in January 2006, an RFP was released. Uh, we were looking for an outside vendor. Uh, in June 2006, a company called Genzabar was secured as a development partner uh, in the project. In April 2007, we had our first uh, delivery release of the software from Genzabar. And then in 2008, in September, we launched a pilot phase, and, and some of you may have been involved in, in, in those pilot phases that we did, but just in, in testing in general and trying out different units and the different types of needs that they might have. The official launch of what we call uh, 2.0, which was the, the release that uh, we initially offered and still do, uh, that happened in July of 2009. Some of you may be familiar that this May, Provost Wilcox actually mandated the use of the system. And if you have questions about that, we can talk a little bit more about that at the end, as that, that might be one part of our presentation that actually gets into the policy uh, piece of this uh, forum today. And then uh, Dave will talk more about this, but 3.5, the next uh, dot release of, uh, of the Genzabar product, is scheduled to launch in October. So we're working through that development right now. So that's kind of the then to now timeline. Just to give you an idea of where we've been, and these are lifetime stats. To date, we've had about 6,500 uh, registrations, and those both are paid and non-paid, because in the system you can have uh, free events or, or activities, as well as for fee events and activities. To date, units have generated about $200,000 in revenue from their activities. There have been about 903, 900 or so sections offered. And currently, there are 100, about 150 or so units that have been trained how to use the system. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave, where we can talk a little bit more about some of the things that might be pertinent to you. And uh, I meant to say at the beginning, if you have questions as we go, as you can tell, this is pretty uh, pretty laid back presentation, so please don't hesitate to pop a hand up or throw something out if you have questions as you go. Just a quick question, uh, Jerry, about what's the difference between this and the Open Education Resource? Sure. If there could be non revenue generating, non credit. Sure. So things that would be in, in Open Educational Resource, I mean, simply if you had something that needed to be managed as far as uh, things that you wanted to keep track of you know, registrants or uh, actual enrollees. This is, the system really allows for that data and that information to be tracked to generate a roster and keep a record of that student. And then same thing on the e-commerce side, it, it provides the, the compliance-based needs that you have in order to process that uh, payment. Open educational resources are, are really quite open in what you might do. Um, certainly if there were events and different types of things that were tied to OER, you could use the registration system to uh, register people and keep track of them, but they're, they're not really connected in that, you know, your open educational resource activities uh, could be done in a number of different, number of different ways. Well, does that help? Yeah. Any other questions before I turn it over to Dave? Brendan. So if I wanted to have someone register for something and pay zero dollars, I could do that in the system? Yes. Yep. Exactly. And there's actually quite a bit of that. 
Um, as you'll see, we get toward the end of the pre presentation, we'll give you an example of what some people are doing, um, and you're probably all being touched in some way, shape, or form by the EBSP activities, EBS activities, and, and they're using the system to register all the internal training for the upcoming uh, quality financial system movement. So, with that, Dave. Thank you very thank much. You. Again, my name is David Shepard. I'm from AIS. I'm from AIS's perspective, the account manager for the non-credit registration system. And I'll try to go through this briefly. Obviously, it's a registration system. Um, but it's also, in, uh, in no limited sense, a content management system. If you are an organization using the non-credit registration system, which is mostly centered around the thought of offerings and sections. Um, so an offering to be Math 101 the sections would be the Monday, Tuesday class, or the Tuesday, or Tuesday, Thursday class, the Friday evening class. So a user of the system can jump in and write up descriptions of the class and all kinds of information, contact information, where it meets, that type of thing, and immediately see it online. And you can go back and forth, activate, deactivate. So it's a pretty powerful content management system. Uh, again, out of the box, it has a handful of reports, roster reports, some profitability reports, um, financial transaction reporting. So that's in the system. Uh, we also do a small amount of identity management. Uh, it's worth noting. Fundamentally, I have three types of people who are in the system. Someone who has an MSU Net ID, so it's faculty, student, or staff, and it's pretty easy to keep track of them. Then there's also community IDs. In general, do people know what a community ID is? Community ID are these things that ATS have provided for us. If you have a Google account, you can identify yourself to MSU through the community ID and we put an MSU net ID behind it that you would never see. So that group of people I can keep track of very easily. So the MSU net IDs, community IDs, very easy to get your arms around. But the people we call them phone in users, we also support. They just call up and say, I'd like the dance class, please. Would you sign me up? And we can enter them in the system in the back end. And those people aren't really recognized by MSU except in the system. So if you have a community that you need to keep track of that's sort of outside of the community ID. They don't own a computer, but they have $10 you'd like to get from them because they want to do a non-credit thing that you're offering. Perhaps this is something to do. Um, all right, so that's kind of what it does out of the box in a nutshell, and apparently that was the wrong key. MSU arrived and, and wrapped around it a handful of other features. We do our own authentication and authorization using Sentinel and D6501 for the admin client users. So if the Department of Chemistry wants to use it, their information is entered into D6501. When they actually log into the system, they'll just see their content and, and they're in. They go through Sentinel to log in. For the website, your typical user, someone out in the street who wants to, to, to browse, does not have to log in. They can see the entire site. They can add things to their shopping cart right up until the last minute when they actually want to make a purchase. Then they have to log in. We also do on-the-fly creation of community IDs. So if you have your own email address and you want to buy something, you can create an account on the fly with, with ATS using the NCRS system. NCRS system. Uh, and as Jerry mentioned, we integrate with Angel. So when the admin client creates a course, it populates a shell over an Angel if you've designated you want to do that. And then all subsequent registrations happen in NCRS and then get pushed to Angel. So pretty handy to keep track of all that stuff. And as Jerry mentioned, we currently are integrated with web credit. Excellent, excellent question. If, and the answer is yes, uh, by October we expect to be integrated with CashNet. And if you are here from an organization that's currently using web credit but not NCRS, it'd be conceivable to convert, if appropriate, into the NCRS system leave web credit out, and then when we convert, you will automatically convert without having to go through the, the process of converting yourself for what it's worth. 